much. Yeah. Thank you very much for the, for the welcome. I, I, just as you speak, say some nice words in Maori. I could say something in Danish, but I think it would be a waste. <laughs> so I won't, but thanks very much. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I learned last night how many were going to be here today, and I'm sort of uh, amazed and, and honored and humbled by that. Uh, thankfully, uh, there will be a lot of people who can tell you about the practical details and how, how these ideas actually work, and it's, of course, uh, great for me to learn that they work and, and to see that they work, and that's part of the inspiration and part of the of the motivation for, to, for, to continue this, to develop this even further, make it even more practical. Sorry, that's, we should start here. Uh, a slight update to the CV. I'm, I'm always embarrassed when I hear people, I, I should put another and shorter CV on the web somewhere. Anyway, I'm no longer at the University of Southern Denmark. Perhaps it's better that, that you said that because nobody can pronounce uh, the town where I'm associated now. It's a, it's a little town in, in southern part of Sweden, and it's pronounced Jönköping, uh, in, in case you're curious about that. And also uh, Macquarie University in, in Australia, that's easier to pronounce. Um, so what I'm, I'm going to talk about now is kind of an introduction, and, and I think you'll see illustrations of that later. I've seen the, the titles in the program about that actually illustrate some of the concepts that I'm going to introduce. And for those of you who have heard this already, my, my profound apologies, but I think this is, with so many people here, there'll be a mixed group, and there must, there must be someone for which this is new, I hope. <clears throat> we heard the, the reporters just come out, and I think it's, it's, it's we all agree uh, that safety is an issue, and. Uh, and we all understand what safety is, and we all, I think, agree, if we ever spoke about it, that safety is that the situation where as little as possible goes wrong. You, you have the definition here, patient safety is the absence of preventable harm. And preventable harm is an interesting concept because there, there are no clear definitions of what preventable harm is. But it's nice to say it's the absence of preventable harm. And of course, harm should be preventable. Um, and in fact, you can't, you can't avoid harm if it isn't preventable. It's almost sort of a logical contradiction. Uh, but that, that's the definition we see around. And in general, in all, all the industries I work with, and it's, it's quite a few, as you heard, it's always safety is when nothing goes wrong or when as little as possible goes wrong. And uh, I just saw the statistics not, not so long ago uh, about the, uh, the causes of death in the US and medical error comes as number three after heart diseases and cancer, medical error, respiratory diseases, and then accidents, broad category, stroke, and so on. And just, just for, uh, so for comparison, because we all know about traffic deaths and we all know about gun deaths in, in the US, that hits the headline, and it actually comes very far down, this, the numbers here from 2008 and the statistics here from 2008, but you see it's about 251,000 due to medical error, whatever that is, because it's not a well-defined category, and 31,000 for, for gun deaths. So it gives you a proportion that there is room, certainly a big concern about that. So everybody agrees, yes, the problem is safety. The problem is that people are harmed we talk about patient safety, but other people are harmed due at work in, in hospitals as well. We shouldn't forget that. So it's is the general issue of safety at work. Um, and uh, we have various definitions, as I've said, and, uh, and uh, we have the way the, the little formula on the upper right-hand corner. The problem with two screens is I can't point to, I can only point to one. Uh, and uh, if I stand far back, maybe I can sort of flip. But you, the one on the upper right-hand corner, that's how we count safety. That's how we, now that's, that's another paradox. We measure safety by counting the number of things that go wrong, which is, as you'll understand in a moment, I'm sure, or you probably understand it already, is a bit strange because safety cannot be what's going wrong. Safety must be what's not going wrong. And we have this, 
when I just loved when I saw this cover from Consumer Reports, your doctor could hurt you. That's very encouraging, isn't it, to put it on Consumer Reports. So what do you do when you're ill? Don't go to your doctor, he could hurt you. <clears throat> so we have this approach to safety that we still see practiced uh, nearly everywhere in every kind, every kind of field. And the approach is <clears throat> we look at the unacceptable outcomes. We are looking at things that go wrong because we, are, we automatically attend to them. And when something goes wrong, we naturally want to understand why. This is sort of a, uh, a, a, a feature of, of humans that we are curious and we want to understand the reason why we don't like situations where something happens and we can't explain it and we can't understand it. We need an explanation. And particularly when something goes wrong, we need an explanation. So we try to find the explanation. We try to find the cause because we believe that if something happens, there must, something else must have happened before that is the cause of that. And we think we can reason backwards and of course we end up with a root cause. And if we can find the cause, given that we spend enough time and enough money and get enough information, we can find the cause and we then we believe because we are rational beings that have developed the world around us, we can eliminate the cause. And if we eliminate the cause, then it's not going to happen again and then we're going to be safe. And that's what drives it. We have the, you don't have the zero vision in, in healthcare, but you do have zero vision. You even have zero vision.co.nz. I mean, you have zero vision.au. You have zero vision uh, programs in, in almost every country. And zero vision means, it doesn't mean you're blind. It means zero accidents. And that's the aim of many industries. Zero accidents is, is, is the cover to gold. And uh, I, think it's, it, I think it's right, of course. It's right that we should not have any accidents. That's not the issue. The issue is, how do we get there? And the classical way, the traditional way here, as we saw, as what we now call safety one, is we get there by looking at what goes wrong, by analyzing that, by finding the causes, by eliminating the causes. We have the report that I just mentioned, learning from adverse events. And this is a common, commonly accepted way of doing it. We have to look at adverse events and we have to reduce them. Unfortunately, as you can see, the curve here, it increases, so it's going in the wrong direction. And uh, so people are sort of desperate to get it to turn and, and go downwards. And that's the, that's the idea of safety one, that we, we call it safety one now, 10, let's see, it's 2012. So six, seven years ago, it wasn't called safety one, it was just called safety. Uh, but there was a growing realization uh, that there was another way of dealing with these issues, trying to achieve the same goal, zero accidents. There's no discussion about that but we could do it in a different way. And to emphasize that, uh, that there is a difference, we came up with something as brilliant as safety two, instead of in, in addition to safety one. It's in hindsight, that was not a smart choice. Uh, and, and hopefully one day we'll find another term that actually is more appropriate for what we're trying to achieve. But anyway, it seems to be, have been accepted. We have people talk about safety one and safety two. You see it in the, in the announcement of this meeting. You see it in many of, of the talks. And it's sort of gotten into the vocabulary on, and, and, and maybe that's uh, fortunate. We, we'll see. Anyway, so safety one is, as you see the definition here, one definition out of many, it's a condition where the number of adverse outcomes, the number of accidents, incidents, harms, and so on, is as low as possible. One issue here is that we define safety by its opposite. I'll come back to that. Another issue is that we measure safety by things that go wrong, which, which is sort of counterintuitive because it means that the higher the level of safety is, the lower the measurement is. And in almost every other wake of life, if you measure something and you make an effort to change it, you want, the more you put into it, the more you want to get out. And safety, the more we put into safety, the less we want to get out in terms of measurements. And that sort of creates a, a small problem and practical problem, in fact. But the, the, perhaps the most important 
issue here is that we want to learn about safety. We, we saw that we need to learn about because we need to be better. And what do we study when we learn, want to learn about safety? We study accidents. And accidents are, by definition, situations where there is no safety, where, where, where there is a lack of safety. So we are in, in, the, in the strange position that we want to study something in situations where we also say it isn't there. And, and scientifically, that's a bit of a problem because it's easier to study something when it's there than when it isn't there. Um, and that's sort of one of the reasons why we came to, to say, well, there must be another way of doing it. So a way to, to talk about safety one and how we practice safety one is to use this analogy of, of the glass or the beaker and say, we are safe if it is empty. If nothing goes wrong, what's in the glass are all the things that go wrong. So whenever something goes wrong and there's a red drop in the glass, we begin to analyze it and find out exactly why it happened and why it came there and what it consists of and find ways of taking it away. And we are, if we can get down to zero, to zero accidents, to the glass is empty, then we are perfectly safe. And that's, that's how patient safety is pursued, hospital safety, aviation safety, mining safety, financial safety, uh, any kind of, of industry you want to talk about, that is the goal of safety, to have as few adverse outcomes as possible because they are, they are nasty, they are unpleasant, and they are expensive. And again, as I said, as, as you also heard in, in, in the previous talk, there's no, safety two doesn't disagree with that. We, are still, we still want to achieve that aim, but we think there's a better way, a better way to do it, a better approach. <clears throat> because when we look at safety, the way we manage safety, what do we do? Well, we look at the accidents. And if you, what, what this diagram tries to illustrate is that above the line of, of the limit of unacceptable performance, which by the way is not a fixed limit because it depends on the situation, of course, and the workload and the economic conditions and, and, and whatever else. Above that line are, is safe performance, safe performance, and safe performance is not something simple and single. It's a multitude of things that go on at the same time. You've already heard the, the term work as done. It's work as done, and work as done consists of many, many things, many people doing a lot of things at the same time, and they're all slightly variable uh, uh, because you can't just, we can't just work following the book. We talk, we always heard the, the terms work as imagined, work as done. Work as imagined is you just follow work along a straight line. Work as done is you actually can't do that. You have to wiggle around a bit. But what do we look at? We look at the snapshots of situations where it doesn't work. And, and sort of the reasoning seems to be if we look at the snapshots, at the random snapshots, because we don't know when they happen, if we look at the random snapshots of situations where the system doesn't work, then we can somehow magically make it work. And when you think of it in that way, and this is, of course, sort of putting it in an in, in extreme form, then it's perhaps obvious that that's not a very good idea because that's not the way to do it. What we want to deal with and now I have to point, I apologize for people who look at that screen, but <laughs> what we wanted, oh, where is he? Ah, here. And you can't, the dot is too small anyway. So what, <laughs> what we want to do is manage what happens up here because that is safe performance. But somehow we have convinced ourselves we can manage it by looking at, at it when it fails. So what does it tell us about when it works, if you want to look at it? when it fails. So, so we have this approach, this is from, the, the, from Australia, from Victoria. Some years ago, there was a report about wrong blood in tube, uh, and uh, they analyzed it. Uh, and of course, this is a very unfortunate event, and it's in a uh, certain case of, of patient safety, and they wanted to, to look into that and understand that. And they found 40 different causes in, in uh, six different categories. So, so you find a number of specific causes and you address each specific cause in turn, oh, the easiest one first, and you do it until, ideally until you have addressed all 40, but usually until you run out of time and run out of money or something else comes along. And then you say, well, it's, it's good. We have met, we have, we've done the best we could and we just continue. And anyway, 
while you do that, the world changes. So it's not the same, and let's say it takes a year to do that, by the end of the year, you're not looking at the same situation anyway. So you can't address it, you can't solve it in that way. But the other problem is, uh, this is a similar case, this is from the UK, <clears throat> that they have this report, uh, 2014 I believe, of, of uh, serious hazards of transfusion, so it's uh, similar, it's about blood, and they say we have 3,017 reported cases of serious hazards of transfusion. As you can see here, they, they, they classify them in detail, they find how many, so 78, 77.8% are errors, whatever errors are, and they are, you can you say causes are so and so and so. And, and this came out as a very nice printed report. They produce a report every year, I've done that for many years. And, but the question that I, because I am, I don't know if you said that, and, 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 uh, but I am a psychologist, and, and, and no, I don't have to apologize for that. But as a psychologist, I can, I can ask naive questions. So I ask the obvious naive question to me, namely, how many transfusions did you have that year? So what's the denom denominator? We know what the numerator is. What's the denominator? The answer was, we don't know which was strange to me because how can you understand what safety is if you don't know what the denominator is? At least, have, and of course, they have an idea about the, the order, the scale of magnitude, how big it is, but they didn't know, they didn't count. They weren't interested. So, what we, what we see when we reason about this and think about this, and many clever people have been thinking about this, and you have two of them here, in, on, the, on the screen, not in the room, unfortunately. <clears throat> we come to the realization that the problem is not safety. So when we think about safety as a picture show, we shouldn't think about things that have gone wrong. The, the image, the association that comes into our mind when you say safety is something good. People are happy, things go well. They are safe. That's what we mean. They are safe. So you shouldn't think about accidents when you say safety. You should think about positive situations. And Jim Reason, who I'm sure you all know by name, uh, said safety is defined and measured more by its absence than by its presence. And he said that 18 years ago, soon 19 years ago. Karl Weig, another famous sociologist, said reliability is a dynamic non-event meaning that what's interesting is or are the non-event when things do not go wrong, when there are no accidents. Instead of saying the interesting thing is the accidents, the things that go wrong, he said, Mike said, no, what's interesting is when there are no accidents. That's what we should be looking at. That is what safety is. It's the absence of accidents, but it's the absence itself we should study not the accidents. And he said they're dynamic, uh, it's a dynamic non-event. And he also said, which is even more important, safety is invisible. Safety is invisible because reliable outcomes are constant and in everything that is constant, not everything, but things that are constant become invisible because we get used to them. This is a phenomenon that's called habituation. And you all know that you get used to things after a while. So, I mean, if you come to to uh, to well, like me, to a hotel in, in in a different city, there are different sounds and different smells and so on. And maybe if there are if now there are no waves outside here, but when we were in Manly, I was at the, had a beach from uh, a hotel room facing the beach, and there were waves in the first night. Because I don't have waves at home, so I heard the waves in, during the night, and the second night, and the third night, I don't hear the waves anymore. Not that the waves have stopped, but I've got used to them. So I don't pay attention to it. And things that happen regularly and are not harmful, and things that, that are sort of common and, and every day, we get used to it. And it's extremely useful that we do that. It would be terrible if we had to pay attention to everything that happens around us. We can't do that. So it's, it's a built-in mechanism in, in all living systems, and it's very, very useful, except when it comes to what we call safety, and we say the things that happen every day and that go well and that we say are trivial things, 
And we even say, nothing happened. We don't notice them, we don't pay any attention to them. And that's what we should. So if you take this diagram, what we see in safety, what we look at are the things on the left-hand side, because these are the rare events and they are different from what normally happens. And because they're different, they attract our attention and we look at them and we're concerned about them and we try to understand them as we rightly should. But there are also all the other events that happen all the time that are not different from each other and we don't notice it. But we should. That's, that's sort of the message of safety too. Look at them as well. Try to understand what goes on. What happens when nothing happens. And if you look at it, life is full of that, what Vike would call dynamic non-events. I just love the term dynamic non-events. That's what life is made up of. And just to take these examples here, none of them are from a hospital. One is from a pharmacy, but the others are from, from other wakes of life. Walking in a, a walking among in the crowd of people, shopping in a supermarket, going to the pharmacy, working on a building site. Things can go wrong in all these places, but usually they don't. And usually we don't pay any attention to the things that you go to the supermarket and you pick the things that you want from the shelves and you go and pay and you don't think about it. But it's a small miracle that things are there and everything just works. Everything is fine, but we just take it for granted and we don't know. We only notice if something is sold out or if the, the, the particular type of soy milk or whatever it is isn't there or, or the particular flavor of yogurt, whatever. I don't know. That's my preference. But anyway. So then we notice it, but we don't notice when it's there. And we just take for granted it's there. And I think it makes good sense to take for granted it's there, but if we want to assure that it is there, which is one, what we want to do when we talk about patient safety, we want to assure that patients are well and, do, and are not harmed in any sense, then we need to pay attention to how it happens. So what happens when nothing happens? Because people say, and, I, and I've had people say that to me as recently as last week, they say, well, yes, of course, uh, of course, we should look at also the situations where there are no accidents. But then they say, but nothing happens. And I know what they mean when they say that nothing happens. They don't mean that in the absolute sense that nothing happens. They mean that nothing unusual happens. But we should say, what happens when nothing unusual happens? And when we study that, we find that or we could also say, why, does, why do we have this situation when nothing happens? Why do we have the successful outcomes? We have them because people adjust to the situations, because people adjust the work to what they do. This is what we have one trying to look at when we talk about work as done, not work as imagined, but how people actually do their work. And they have to adjust to the situation they have to adjust to the conditions, they have to adjust to the demands, to the resources, to, to changes, to interruptions, to what the colleagues do, to small delays or whatever. And that happens all the time and we do it fluently and we don't notice it because we do it fluently. That's why things go well on the, on the left-hand side. But it's also why things sometimes don't go well. And that's the interesting point, that we don't need speci specific reasons or, or special reasons for why things don't go well. It's exactly the same reasons. So we can say, how do, how do people make these adjustments? And what I try to illustrate here with these pictures is they make adjustments. Everybody makes adjustments. From the, usually we talk about the sharp end and the blunt end, but everybody in every possible situation in, in society from, from the from the, the poor guy who stands here and talks to you, to the, to the minister or the president, or the, in Denmark we have a queen, uh, they all make adjustments all the time. And we can study these adjustments, and we can make sense of them, because we make adjustments, you can say, broadly in three, three categories, three major types of adjustments. We adjust the things because we want to create and maintain a situation where we can do our work. Usually, very often, you get into, you get into your office and you get into the place where you, where you have to work, and it's not always 
quite in order, so you may you know, adjust things slightly, put things in the right way, make sure the resources are there, make sure that there's paper in the printer and so on, and then you start doing your work. And we maintain it if the conditions change as, as you go along. We make adjustments if something uh, happens uh, on the way, if something becomes unavailable, but also if, if something suddenly becomes available and allows us to do things that we really have planned to do later, we can do it now. We adjust to that and try to make use of the opportunities. Uh, and we make adjustments, again, if you see that something could happen that could jeopardize the, the, the work, that could disrupt the work, that could prevent us from actually achieving what we want to achieve. So we make these adjustments, others make adjustments, and we, are, we, we get used, we learn how others make adjustments, and we learn how to work together. That's why if you have if somebody's ill and you have a replacement in, in your team, in the beginning it'll be a bit bumpy until you have learned how to work with each other again. We do that and we do it so fluently that we don't pay any attention to it. And we shouldn't pay attention to it as we do the work, but we should pay attention to it as we think about work. So this leads to the idea that we can increase safety by doing things well and, and the Consequence of that, and I think there'll be some illustrations in the presentations later, and certainly there are in the, in the books that have been written about that and many papers that have been written about that, the, that the, the consequence of this way of thinking is that if you have an unacceptable outcome, you should not rush to find the cause. But you should say to yourself or to others that if some, when something goes wrong, it is not the first time it's being done. People have done it before. They have done it perhaps many times before, perhaps even daily, and it goes well usually. All the other times it has gone well. This is the first time it goes wrong. So we need to understand how it goes well as a background for perhaps understanding why it didn't go well in that situation. There's no unique special cause that didn't, otherwise didn't exist. It just popped up out of nowhere. <clears throat> So this leads to the idea of, of safety too, no, no surprises. It's a condition where the number of successful outcomes is as high as possible. And I, I sort of like the, the WHO definition of health. It's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Sim similarly, safety is not merely the absence of accidents or incidents or harm. Safety is something different. And that's why safety two is perhaps not the best term. We'll come back to that, maybe. Uh, so managing safety two, to use the same analogy, we can manage safety two, we can think about managing safety two as trying to fill the glass or fill the beaker. If everything goes well, it becomes full. So we should try and understand what is in the glass and how can we make sure it's full because we are safe if, it, if it's full. We are safe if everything goes well. And of course, obviously, if something goes well, it can't go wrong at the same time. Not in our macroscopic world. In, in the quantum world, that can happen. But we're not living in a quantum world. We're living in the real world, you know, real macroscopic world where you can touch things. And things can't go well and not go well at the same time. So, so it doesn't make sense to say, let's try to make sure things go well, because in that, in that way, we also ensure that they don't fail. But we don't focus on how they fail and try to prevent that. We focus on how they go well and try to, to further that and, and improve that. There's still, the red dots will show, there's still things that go, that fail, and we still have to look at them, we still have to, to understand them, but we can understand them in a different way now, because we can understand them on the basis of the normal work, the everyday work that goes well. So the question is, of course, the big question for research and for practice is, how do these dynamic non-events happen? <clears throat> and this is where, I lost completely track of time, but I hope somebody will tell me. And I hope it doesn't matter if I finish too early, because then we have time to, to talk and discuss. Resilience engineering, which was sort of hap happened before resilient healthcare, resilience engineering was the first formal meeting that 
that had that name was in 2004, whereas the first meeting on resilient healthcare was in 2012. So we were, there was sort of a period of eight years where the ideas of resilience engineering gradually developed. And resilience engineering has proposed that we can understand how things go well. We can understand the dynamic non-events by looking at what, what it is that enables a system to do things well. This is, and, 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 and the idea is we can look at four potentials for that. Settling for four potentials is a deliberate simplification. Of course, it's not like that in, in the real world. There are probably many, many other things that play a role, but, but to be practical and, and, and to, do, to be able to do something, we, we need somehow to, we always need to simplify things, but we need to simplify them in a way that makes sense. And it seems to make sense to say that we have, we, things go well, we have the dynamic non-events if there are four things or four cap capabilities or four potentials, namely that the system, the hospital, the industry, whatever, is able to respond in a flexible way when something happens. That, that almost goes without saying because if you can't respond, I mean, you're, you're out of the game. So, so it's not staggering news, of course. Uh, the second potential is the potential to monitor, to keep an eye on what's going on, to know what's happening, to have a feeling for what's happening, to have a feeling for what's going to happen next. Because if you have a feeling for, or if you see what's, going to, what's happening, and that's why we have key performance indicators and performance measurements to see what's happening, then you can prepare yourself. You can put yourself in the ready state, state, you get an early warning, an early alert, because you can't be constantly ready to respond. Then you can't do anything. So we have to, in order to be able to respond sensibly, we have to monitor what's going on. So we can sort of say, oh, this looks like this is going to happen, or, or we have a famous uh, case that, that we have been discussing a lot in this meeting with a, and the final match in ice hockey in Canada and people at the, the emergency uh, department realized that now it's time to get ready uh, because if you in, in Canada, obviously if you have a, a final in, in ice hockey, people are going to start to fight outside the rink and uh, people are going to need uh, hospital services. So that's what happened. Uh, so, but it's monitoring. What happens is sort of being aware of what's happening and what could happen so we are ready to respond when it happens. It's learning. You need to be able to learn and not only from what has gone wrong. In fact, you need to be able, it's more important to learn from what has gone well than to learn from what has failed. Because if you learn from what has failed, you learn what not to do. If you learn from what has gone well, you learn what to do, and this is far more useful. And of course we need to learn, because if we don't learn, we will always respond in the same manner. And we will always look at things in the same manner. And unless the world is perfectly stable and unchanging, we have to learn. And unfortunately, the world is not stable and unchanging, as I'm sure you know. And finally, we have to anticipate. It's necessary to be able to anticipate. Anticipate is not monitoring. Monitoring is keeping track of the current situation. Anticipating is thinking about the future. It can be the short-term future. You say, if I do this, if I, if I plan this treatment, if I make this intervention, what's going to happen? Based on your understanding of the system, your knowledge of the system, you predict that this will be the consequences and you try to do, you choose to do that which will bring with, which you think will bring you the outcome that you want. But it's also anticipating on a longer term, looking further ahead, looking at, at the, that's like we have the weather prediction, what's the winter going to be like? Now, I sorry to say winter because I'm going back to winter. What's the summer going to be like? Uh, in, in Japan, they, they had a terrible summer this year. I just saw that the, the kanji for, for, for 2018, well, I think it was disaster. Every year they, have, they choose a kanji to represent the year. And this year, it was because they've had a terrible year with flooding, with, with typhoons and, and, and everything, so they, they chose a kanji to represent that. 
uh, that is anticipating what's going when, when, of course, you anticipate, we just heard earthquakes. Uh, what should you do if you, if you have an earthquake? And you anticipate when you build a building, it's not only what do we do here. And, and I was told I should have to crawl under a table so we will all disappear under the tables in case it starts to shake. Uh, but also when you build, when you plan ahead, when you build a hospital, you have to think ahead. 40 years, 60 years, maybe 100 years. How old are the hospitals that you work in now? When were they built? What did people think about today's conditions when they built a hospital? And well, did they anticipate well enough? So we have to anticipate. It's necessary. We can't, you can't be resilient. You can't do things well if you only respond, monitor, and learn. You have to anticipate as well, even though it's the most difficult. And this brings me to something that, that actually is practical because thinking in these ways, we say, well, can we assess that? Can we get a feeling for how well it's being done? And the answer is yes. If you want to manage something, if you want to manage your healthcare system or your hospital or your department or your unit, whatever you want to manage, your whole organization, there are three things that you must be able to do. You must know where you are. You must know your current position. You cannot manage something unless you know where you are right now. Take something as simple as traveling or moving or walking or getting here. You say, I want to get there, but you need to know where you start from. You need to know your current position. If you manage safety in a hospital, you need to know what is the current position, what's the current state, where are we now? You need to know where you want to be, obviously, and you all knew where you wanted to be because you're here today. And, you, and, and the third thing is you need to know how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And again, talking physically, you all knew how to get here in various ways. We all know how to move in various ways by, I mean, I see by, by the waterfront, many ships, cars, bikes, whatever, airplanes coming from the airport. We know how to move physical things, but if you want to move a hospital from one position of safety to another position of safety, how do you do that? You can't push it, you can't drag it, you can't turn a steering wheel. You, can, you have, people have safety dashboards, but they don't have the similar controls to sort of, uh, even though the dashboard will sort of go into the red, but what do you do to get it back into the green again? There's no no steering wheel, no joystick, and it would be lovely, wouldn't it? The joystick for hospitals. So, uh, <clears throat> but to come back to it, this is this is goes for any kind of management. You must know where you are, you must know where you want to be, and you must know how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Now, this unfortunately doesn't solve all three problems at the same time. It would be wonderful if it did, but it doesn't. But it solves one problem, and maybe it solves a bit of the second, and maybe a little bit of the third. It solves the first problem of where are we? What is the state? What is our condition? How able are we? How capable are we? What are our potentials? Because we can ask questions about the potentials. We can't ask, or we can, but we shouldn't ask questions about how well are we able to respond. That does, that's not meaningful because that's too, too large a thing. But you can, and now I'm in, in the in slightly embarrassing position and I can't remember what the next slide looks like. So can I, if you look away, I'll just peek. And Okay, sorry. It, it, was, it wasn't what I had hoped, but uh, <clears throat> never mind. I, I should have uh, added that. Because you can ask specific questions. Well, let's take, take, let's take learn instead of saying respond. Instead of saying, how, how good is our potential to learn, you can say, well, what do we look at? What do we learn from? Do we only learn from failures or do we also learn from successes? When do we learn? Do we learn when something has happened or do we try to learn continuously? I'll give you an example this afternoon of continuous learning. Uh, um, how do we learn? Uh, is it individual learning? Is it organizational learning? How is the, the results of learning implemented in the organization? What are the resources that are set aside for learning? Are they sufficient? 
how do we, how is learning maintained in the organization or in the individual? Uh, how is learning verified? Uh, it, do we have enough time to learn? Uh, uh, is the internal communication good enough? So you can ask a number of specific questions with regard to learning, to monitoring, to responding, uh, to anticipating. And this is a slide I should have had, which, which I, actually I have it, uh, but you can't read it because it's too small. <clears throat> but the idea is here that we have developed sets of four sets of questions. Uh, and and I'm, I'm very, you, you can find it on, the, we have websites where you, where you have that, and there are papers that have, have uh, described that. So we're very happy to give you the information. Four sets of questions that have to be that are generic, so you have to tailor them to your situation. You have to make them specific. You have to make sure that the questions are diagnostic. And you have to make sure that they're formative, meaning that the questions are so concrete that once you get the answers, like if people say, well, oh, we're not really satisfied with, our, uh, with the, the time that has been set aside to discuss learning, well, then you know what to do about it. You need to say, well, we need to increase the time. We need to find ways that, that people feel they have enough time to do that. And so what do we need to change to do that? That's another issue. But it, it's more concrete and it allows you, so it actually allows you both to say, what do we want to achieve? But also maybe how can we achieve it? It doesn't solve it completely and automatically, but in some sense. So we have, have this, this method, or, or I guess you would call it a method, uh, which, which bears the, as you can see, the <coughs> unfortunate name, the Resilience Assessment Grid, which has the unfortunate acronym RAG. But there it is. Uh, it was, it was uh, created in a hurry, as, as all, I think most method acronyms are created in a hurry because somebody has to go to a meeting and present something to someone else. Um, and so that, that was certainly the case here. So. It's called the RAC Resilience Assessment Grid, never forget that. But the idea is you have these four sets of questions, you, you, uh, uh, you, you also need to think about the, the, in the dependency among the potentials because of course it's obvious that the four potentials, respond, monitor, learn, and anticipate, are not independent potentials. You can't just treat them one by one by one in isolation. They depend on each other. So you have to think about that. Then you have to apply the RAC repeatedly uh, and, and get the results and get a, a profile. And as an a a easy illustration here, this is kind of radar diagram that, that's quite often used because it's an easy visual representation of the answers. You can see that the, the spokes there are the the, the various questions and the, the points are how, depending on how you rate the answers, you get this, this uh, polygon, which is uh, visually a very powerful figure, particularly if you compare polygons over time, because you can see changes. And you can see whether you move in the right direction or in the wrong direction. And you can then talk about that and perhaps find ideas out about how to do that. So that's, that's a rag and it's being used in, in a number of healthcare organizations and in in, in other, other domains as well. And I think I'm getting to my last slide. I am, yes. Um, so you, what I've, I hope I've given you an idea about sort of what, what's the thinking about this, the background and, and the broad picture. You'll hear more specific presentations uh, during the day. I, I can see from the program, I look forward to listening to them. If you're interested uh, in it, uh, want to look a little more at it, there is something called the Resilient Healthcare Net. Um, I should say that at the moment it's in the process of being moved from Denmark to Australia, so there may be some hiccups uh, uh, in, in a couple, in, during now or maybe in a couple of weeks, but it should soon be up and back again. Uh, and, and this contains all the information you could possibly want to, to get, I hope, about the previous meetings, papers, uh, who is in the network and what does it do and how do you get active and so on. Also about the meetings, the next meeting will be in, in, um, in Japan next year in uh, near Osaka. Um, 
Also, as you can see, we have four books. The latest book is, is called Delivering Resilient Healthcare, which we have here. There's actually a fifth book, which has just now gone to the, or is on, the, on its way to the publisher, I think. Uh, and uh, who knows, there might be more books. So the aim of this network of the people, and, and some of you who are here in this room have been to several of the meetings. So the aim of this network is not to produce paper and books and chapters. The aim is to develop something practical. And you can perhaps see it from the titles. The first one was called Resilient Healthcare. The second one book was called The Resilience of Everyday Clinical Work. The third book was called My Glasses. Reconciling Work as Done and Work as Imagined. And the fourth book is called Delivering Resilient Healthcare. So we're getting more and more practical. The fifth book is called Working Across Boundaries in Healthcare, which is even more practical. So we are, we are trying to be really as practical as possible, and, and thanks to the many, many good people who are working there uh, to help poor psychologists like me, I think we are slowly achieving that. So with that, thank you very much for listening to me. We're running quite a, a bit ahead of time, so there's a lot of opportunity for questions um, of Eric. So the floor is open. You, you have to be captured for posterity. I think the, the, the safety tube stuff is obviously the way forward, and the, those of us that have been reading it for a while are completely converted. How do you get the wider public and the hospital systems to actually accept that this is a way forward? Because we are so entrenched into our looking at what's gone wrong and a blame culture. And that's even in New Zealand where we have ACC, which takes a lot of that away. Well, that is a good question. I'm, I don't know if I'm the right one to answer that. But I mean, one way of saying it, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled there are so many people here today. So somehow it seems we seem to get, get the attention of of a, a wider and wider audience for that. I don't know what we can do to, to spread the, uh, to tell everybody about this. I don't even know if that's what we need to do. Uh, I think, personally, I think if we are able to change the way things happen in practice, people will notice that. And that's perhaps the best way of telling them about what's going on. It's not just a propaganda issue, but uh, it, it's spreading, and I think, I mean, you can talk to that, Carl. It's, it's, you, you, you found out about this. Maybe you can even tell us how you found out about, about this. And then you read a book. OK, well. And then you, then you talk to your colleagues, and it spreads around like rings in the water. And I think that's how it happened. And that's how it happens. It's not a deliberate attempt to spread it to as many as possible. But it, we, we, the people who are involved in this do this because they think it makes sense. And, and if it actually makes sense, then others will notice that, and they will say, well, let's try that as well. And that's why you are so many here today, I guess. Just going to answer that. I think a good start is that the safety people and the quality people need to talk to each other. Was that a, that wasn't a question, was it? <laughs> Hi. Um, when we're talking about safety too as a concept, I understand how that would work in an organization to make improvements going forward. When we're doing adverse event reporting, we're generally doing it to a specific audience, and a lot of the time that includes the, the, either the patient or the patient's family to where harm has been done. And it would strike me as a patient or a patient's family that if I saw a report full of, well, we did lots of things well, that would be um, quite offensive. They, they, they quite often want to know where, why things have gone wrong and where they went wrong, which goes back to safety one. So I'm just interested in how you bring that through into report writing for adverse events. Yes, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> 
people notice, and, and, and certainly patients notice when things don't go well. But they also notice when they go well, and, 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 and they are grateful for, for that. And they, I know they send letters or give presents or whatever to the hospital when they, when they leave. But, but, uh, but uh, coming back to what I said about habituation, we get used to things that just work, and we don't pay attention to them because there are too many. And we, I don't think we should expect people to pay, it, pay attention to it deliberately, but maybe we can try and uh, in the in the the way we talk about healthcare and the way we write about healthcare and the annual reports and so on to to make a point that <clears throat> mean how things go well also what improvements have been made and what's the what the satisfaction we have in Denmark something called the the patient satisfaction uh, index which is sort of based on on asking patients how satisfied were you with your you you stay at the hospital and you have an annual, annual number about that 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 the government has said this this is useful so i'm not sure that number in itself has is very sensible but but the the interest is certainly there and i think we should but i think we should try to do it in a way that's natural to people we shouldn't we shouldn't try and impose something uh, but we should try to gradually turn our attention and 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 turn everybody's attention not only in healthcare, but in everyday life, to what goes well. And there are too many, as Prince Charles said, he would like to see good news in the newspaper, so would I, every now and then. Absolutely. Uh, but you need the mic. Hi, I'm, Hi, I'm Carl. I'm very loud. Um, just to answer that one, I agree with you. This is one of the problems we have, is that it's actually quite um, intimidating to tell families and patients that the system has intrinsic risk. We work in a complex system with intrinsic risk. The, the dishonour we do to patients with adverse events is we look back and we say, there's a special thing that happened, we've found out what it was, we've fixed it and it will never happen again. And when we, when we rush to a solution that is, doesn't reflect the reality of what's going on, and we just are telling people that we've fixed it, it's all sorted, then that's actually really not the right thing. So th the key thing here is when we look back, we need to understand what do people normally do, not what do the rules say, what do people normally do, and what was different about the conditions this time that meant what normally worked didn't. And it's quite a different question. So you approach the questions with a different frame because they're not, it's not this special magical category where something went wrong. People were doing what they normally do, that normally works, only this time it didn't. And so you look back with a different approach uh, to understanding and learning, and you actually end up with quite different questions, observations, and therefore solutions. And so I, I don't think they're incompatible, and I can, I'll talk about it a bit more. Um, I can talk a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question. I, 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 sorry. <laughs> With all the reading that I've done on safety one and safety two, um, I think some of the comments you've made before, Eric, were we don't need to totally get rid of safety one. It's actually a combination of both. And the emphasis does need to be on what's going well in order to inform what didn't go well. Would that be right? Have I got that right? That, that, uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think Carl is going to emphasize that as well. And, it, it, and it, it's very important to say it's not safety one against safety two. It's a change in perspective. We look at everything that happens, but we look at it from the perspective of trying to understand why it happens, both when it goes well and when it doesn't go well. Okay, all right. So it was the last question. All right, well, I think we should. Um, all right, one last question. All right. No. Um, I, I would like to know um, how you avoid um, superstition. Um, because if you're looking at things going well, and you could put um, the fact that things um, went well down to a certain thing that you did, but in fact it was a superstition. Like, for example, uh, that you treated all cases of viral illnesses with antibiotics and all the patients got better, but you put it down to the antibiotics. Which and So you make, you've drawn the wrong conclusion because something that you did appe appeared to work uh, 
and, and so everything went well, the patient got better, but it was, wasn't because of something that you had done. <sighs> right. Uh, it's, a, it's a little hard. I mean, it's not, it's the, I think it's the acoustic and the speaker, so, but, but if I understand it right, um, I would say it, it, what, we, what we want to do is not to look at what goes well in the sense that we want to find the causes of what things go well. Uh, and so just sort of reversing the approach to look at the other side of the coin. But we want to look at how things are being done because we really don't know. We know that ourselves if we think about it, but we don't pay any attention to how things actually happen. And the normal variations and adjustments and the way work start, fits together naturally and it, and it works smoothly, sort of the things are ironed up. We all know that have a feeling, intuitive feeling, this, was, this went well, this was a good day, this was a bad day. But very few people can say why it was a good day and why it was a bad day. And we need, I think the argument would be, we, instead of saying, oh, it was a bad day, why was it a bad day? Maybe we should also say this was a good day, but why was it a good day? What was it that happened? Not in the sense of there's a cause of and effect relation, but sort of get a better understanding. And by getting a better understanding of it, we're also better able to see it and identify it and recognize it, and therefore better, better able to manage it when it actually happens. I hope that was a, an answer to your question. 